Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Simon. Simon, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on. We appreciate your time. That's a pleasure. Simon, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Okay. I'm Simon. I'm 45 years old. I'm from uh, the northwest of England, a borough called Lancashire. I'm a father of three kids, all boys, actually. Um, At the moment, not working due to requiring surgery on my spine. But when my encounter happened, it was 1996. I was 21 years old. And I think that's about it. Well, truth be told, you sound like a well-rounded guy who unfortunately had some dogman encounters. It's too bad you had those experiences. And by the way, I'm sorry to hear about your back. When is your surgery scheduled for? Any time in the next six months. Wow. Well, I hope that goes well. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. We spoke for the first time about your encounters last night. Considering how shook up you got when you were telling me about your first encounter, how do you sleep? Um, After speaking to you for the first time, it felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders and I I actually fell asleep quite calm. And for the first time, it felt, I just felt at ease. I've actually got it off my chest. It felt good. Oh, good. That's really good news. Yeah, I think anyone would be shaken up after an experience like that. That first encounter of yours is something else. After you found out about this show, there was an episode you listened to that made you decide to contact me. Please expand on that for us. It was episode 190. A guy that came home from work. He had a small holding, so he had a few cattle that was all in one corner of the paddock. And his wife said they'd been like that all day and they wouldn't move. Him and a friend got in the the ATV and they went to search around the land to see if there was anything that was causing the animals to behave in this strange manner. And as they turned into one of the tracks on his land, herds of deer just ran past them in the opposite direction and running for their lives. Uh, and it's at that point that him and his friend spotted a dog man off to the side in the trees. And his friend shot it. But it didn't kill it. It just didn't really phase the dog man at all. And the dog man actually gave chase. Chased him and his friend for a few miles. And that was the first dog man encounter that I heard. I stumbled upon it completely by accident. I was looking on YouTube and came across Dogman Encounters, and it was a happy accident. I had no idea what a dogman was, so I, I listened to it, and it resonated with me because I realised at that point that is what I'd had an encounter with back in '96. Well, actually, you had a really good idea what a dogman was. You just didn't realize that's what it was called. And that's episode 190 with Brandon Close. But having said that, like you just said, you had your first encounter in 1996. If someone would have asked you for your thoughts on the existence of creatures that look like giant werewolves 10 seconds before you had that encounter, what would you have told them? I'd have told them no. And that if I was in the movies watching a movie, yeah, but to see it that in front of me in real life, I would have said no. I've always had an interest in the paranormal and cryptids, but as far as I'm aware, nothing's been officially ever reported in the UK of dogmen or 
Sasquatch, Bigfoot, whatever you want to call it. So I thought we'd never, ever come across anything like this. And when I did, I was shocked. I was genuinely shocked. Well, most people would be shocked. Yeah, nothing in life is going to prepare you for the fact that those guys are in existence. You're no shrinking violet, Simon. You're actually a strong, tough guy who knows how to take care of himself. Without telling us any details from your encounters, do you think that made it harder or easier for you to deal with your encounters? Uh, th- easier, in a way, because with the type of work that I was doing, you need to be, obviously, you need to be physically tough, but you need to be mentally tough. So I think it helped. I think it gave me a better understanding, a better way of dealing with what I'd seen, what I've encountered. So, yeah, I think I think I was better prepared because of what my background. I see. It might seem strange that I ask that. It's always better to be tougher, right? Well, not always. If you have an encounter with a dog man and if you are really upset because of that encounter, have a hard time sleeping, well, yeah, some people with that tough mindset can't cope with that very well. So that's why I was asking you about that. Since you found out about the Appalachian Dogman, you've researched them quite a bit. While you were studying them, you noticed that the idea of them existing in the UK is poo-pooed by quite a few people in the cryptid community there. Is that a big source of frustration for you? No, not a source of frustration. I wish I'd known about it sooner. But no, I wouldn't. It's not, it's not, it's not a source of frustration as such. Good. I'm glad that's not bothering you because, like I told you, it doesn't make a bit of difference whether they believe that they're there or not. They are. So, that's all there is to that. All right, Simon, you've got several encounters to tell us about tonight, so let's get to it now. Please give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. Well, like I said, my first encounter happened in 1996. I was 21 years old. I'd got back eight days early from assignment. Um, I'd been working with a team. We'd been bodyguarding rich businessmen. We'd been through different locations throughout Europe, doing different um, locations all through this guy's business. And what we were doing, we were basically bodyguarding him because some of the situations that he was putting himself in. <laughs> he wouldn't have been able to handle it on his own. He needed a team around him that could be the eyes and ears. I got back, like I say, eight days early. My girlfriend didn't know I was back. So the day I got back home was a Thursday. I contacted a few friends. And I asked them not to let my girlfriend know I was back and that I wanted to surprise her on the Friday. So I arranged with friends that on Friday evening we was going to meet up in town, uh, hit a few bars and a few clubs and meet up with my girlfriend just so happens my best friend anthony his girlfriend shirley is my girlfriend's best friend so because of that we had to let shirley know what was happening but she had to she promised not to tell anything to julie about me being back anyway as the night went on the drinks were flowing, we were all in good spirits. And we met up with my girlfriend Julie and her best friend Shirley. And I surprised her because she had no idea I was back. She thought I was still in Germany. So she was pleased to see me, as I was pleased to see her as well. The night was good. We were having a fantastic evening. Then I surprised everybody because I went down on one knee and proposed to Julie. 
she said yes. So that put myself in really, really high spirits. Everything was great. At the end of the night, because this took place the last week in July to the first week in August, the weather was nice. It was nice. It was warm. And rather than get taxis back home, as we all lived in the same area, give or take a mile or so, we all lived very close to each other. So there was myself and Julie and Shirley and Anthony. And then there was another friend of mine, Neil, his girlfriend, Caroline. And then there was two other friends, Steve and Martin. Out of this group of friends, Caroline and Martin are no longer with us. Caroline died 10 years ago. Thereabouts, Martin died two years ago. <clears throat> but on the night of the encounter, we all decided we were going to walk back home from where the town centre is we decided to walk through the biggest park in our town it's a huge park with a lot of history so we walk through the park and then you get to a certain point and then it's on an incline and it rolls down at the bottom of the incline there is the river it's a big fast flowing river and there's a big stone built bridge that runs over the river many many years ago that was a, a railway line a railway line was on that bridge and i'm not sure which direction it took when it came over the bridge but it was a railway line bridge it's now been, the rails have been taken off and it's been tarmacked over. So we're all in good spirits. So we're, none of us were in a rush to be home. So we we're just walking along. We were laughing and joking. And we can hear as we were walking across the bridge, off to the right hand side, about half a mile down the track there is an old factory that used to make medical supplies and we know that that building is patrolled by a security patrol with guard dogs the noise that we could hear sounded like two dogs possibly more fighting um we paid it no attention we just didn't think they could they could get out we thought that they would be, they'd be fine. They'd stay where they were, and we just carried on, carried on walking. Um, as we basically come to the end of the bridge, we're on now what we, what was, it's referred to as the old railway line. There's no railway lines there, but it's where the railway line used to be. We've just come onto the old railway line and we could hear something moving very fast. It sounded a little bit like a horse galloping, but it sounded a little bit different to than a horse. We didn't really have ever have a clue what it was. And then it's as it's got close to it's come up the twenty foot banking up onto the railway lines, but it's burst through the trees and the bushes on the right hand side onto the railway line. And none of us knew what it was. All I can say is it had very dark fur and it was huge. It was bigger than any domesticated dog I've ever seen. I'd go as far as to say it's bigger than any dog, any wolf I've seen in a zoo. This thing was enormous. It was black 
or dark brown fur. It was incredibly dark. It was a huge, huge beast of a creature. At the time, I had no idea what this creature was. Uh, I now know that this to be a dogman. Um, and as it's come up in front of us, a couple of us may have just said, what is that? And it heard us. And it turned round to look at us, to look at, look at us as a collective group. And the first thing I noticed were the eyes. The eyes were uh, an amber colour and they, they, they were very, very piercing. When, when it looked at you, it, it, it was like it was looking through you. It was, uh, It was it was it was a scary thing to see. Um, having never ever seen anything with eyes like that, none of us had the faintest idea what this what this what this creature in front of us was. Um, my instincts kicked in at this point. Like I say, I, I work as a bodyguard. And my number one priority at this point is my girlfriend, Julie. So I've made sure that I'm a barrier between this thing and her. If it wants to get to where it's going through me first. Funnily enough, Anthony did the same thing and so did Neil with Shirley and Caroline. Um, at the same time I'm noticing this thing is huge it's eyes it's amber eyes the way it stares at you and the, the, the smell the smell kind of hit me as an afterthought but it smelled awful if you can imagine stale wet dog mixed with rotten food rotten meat it, it, it's it wasn't it wasn't nice let's put it like that um but as it's as it was stood watching us and staring at us it slowly started to stand up then on its on its hind legs And this is where things take a strange turn because I have never seen a dog stand on its hind legs as long as this one did. It stood up with ease. And when it when it stood up, it must have been it must have been nine nine, maybe ten foot tall. It was massive. I'm, I'm a good, pretty, a pretty good judge of of size. Um, in the job that I do, one of my colleagues is seven foot one, and this thing would have made him look like a kindergartner. It was, it was the size, the sheer size of it. Just when it stood up, that was, that was, that was. It, it kind of takes your breath away. <laughs> I'd never ever encountered a living thing that big. Um, it stood up, and its its eyes were kind of flicking from one of us to the next, to the next, to the next. It was weighing up. It was weighing us up, and I think it was weighing up its next move. Um, the whole time 
Julie's got her arms round my waist from the back, and all I could feel was her trembling. I say her trembling, it could well have been myself just trembling, but that's what I could feel. Um, but it's when it stood up in front of you. That's when a feeling of shock hit me because this thing, as well as being as tall as it was, it didn't have a flat face. It had, it had the face, if you can imagine the face of a German Shepherd crossed with a Malamute Husky. So the, the, the muzzle wasn't as long as a German Shepherd's. And it wasn't, it was a bit shorter, it, it was a bit broader. And the teeth were, the, uh, the teeth were massive. Um, I have no, no doubt at all if that thing wanted to bite anybody. It will be life changing to life ending. Um, but yeah, but it, that's that's the way it looked to me. The cross between a German Shepherd and a Malamute Husky. Big ears stood upright on the top of the head, and also on the on the, on the muzzle. It had an open wound. It was slowly oozing. So I think when we when I heard dogs fighting, I think it was a the dog man was fighting. Fighting what I don't know. Um the next thing I noticed was it didn't have much of a neck. Because its neck just seemed to be one really, really thick, solid muscle, and its the neck, the, the, the muscles in its in its neck, kind of blended with the shoulder muscles, and to give you an idea of what that looks like is, you think of one of those big the big wrestlers from the from the WWE or something like that, and you think of their their big muscles on the shoulders that kind of blend into the neck muscles. That's what it was like. Um, and talking of its shoulders, they were very, very wide. It was extremely broad. And from its shoulders, the top, I say the top part of its arm, from the shoulder to the elbow, was, I'd say that was a normal, a normal length for a human arm. But this thing didn't have dog arms, dog, you know, dog legs. It had a human arm. It's, like I said, from the shoulder to the elbow, it was like a human arm, and it was extremely ripped. It was the muscles had muscles, and it was huge again. And then from the el from the elbow to the wrist, if you imagine a normal human arm, but this was virtually double the length of what it should have been. But it was like, a, it, it, again, it's just like a thick trunk. And then at the end of this thick trunk were these enormous hands. Not paws, hands. And each finger on this hand was, it was like, each one was like a banana. It was so thick. And at the end of each finger was really, really long claws. A good three, 
a four inch claws on the end and these things as filthy as they looked they looked sharp and deadly um and the odd thing was as well as it not having legs like a dog at the front its chest wasn't dog-like, its chest was human-like in its features. Although it was extremely heavily muscled, it looked like a human chest and torso. And then, on its chest, it was hairy, but it was... It was thin. It was nowhere near as thick as the hair on the dog's back. On the dogman's back, when we, when it first, we first saw it, the fur was extremely thick. On its chest, it wasn't as thick. Um, and then for something that had such broad shoulders, the waistline, the waist seemed really disproportionately small. It, it must have been, it must have only been a 30 inch waist. Or something that that had such broad shoulders, it looked it looked a bit strange. Um, and then from from the waist down, it was a lot heavier on its hind legs, but the hind legs they were like a dog's they were like a normal big dog but the, the the knee the backwards facing knee and its feet were dog's feet um yeah I, I, it felt like my senses, it felt like my mind was playing tricks on me. But I knew that all around me was complete silence. I knew what I was feeling, my friends were feeling. They were struggling to, to, to understand what they were seeing in front of them as much as I was. I wasn't alone. Um, the one last feature about this this uh, dog man was it was male. It uh, its genitals were there for whoever to see. It was was big. It was a big beast of an animal. An animal. It was uh, unbelievable, and it kind of. It stood still, and it was it was staring, but its eyes were flicking from one to the next, to the next, to the next. Not knowing what to think, it took a step closer, um, and it was constantly as well. You could see its nose wrinkle up every now and again as it was sniffing the air. And it took another step closer. I'm starting to think that this thing is... This is going to be the end. And this is how I'm going to... I'm going to, I'm going to go out. I'm going to leave this life now. And I'm going to leave it at the hands of this creature. I never thought I'd go out like that. Never. But I honestly thought that that was it. That was my... That was... And that's where my life was going to go. 21 years old. Killed by this creature. Look at it. And I'm glad to say it didn't end that way. But that's how I felt at the time. And. It took a step closer. And that. My girlfriend Julia the whole time is pulling on my waist. She knew what I was going to 
And I was, she knew what I was going to do before I knew what I was going to do. And that's... Some people have a fight or flight mode. Some of it, I suppose you could put down to ego. The rest of it, you could put down to my training. And fight or flight with me tends to be fight. And I took half a step forward. And I clenched both fists at this point. I'm thinking to myself. If it's going to kill me, I'm going down, swinging. As I've clenched my fists, it's kind of turned slightly, so it's it's looking square on at me. And it met my it it met my gaze with its it it stared it was it was staring directly at me at this point. I've got both fists clenched. My heart is thumping out of my chest at this point. I can feel Julie still latched onto me, trembling. And this thing looked at me and showed, showed a level of intelligence that I never, ever expected. And it slowly Shook its head from side to side, like it was saying to me, don't be stupid. You know it's not going to end well. And at that point, I took a half step back. And it was at that point that I unclenched my, my fists. And uh, this thing then, it took a step backwards and it was still sniffing, it was still looking at us all as a collective group and There was a noise, there was another noise off further down the old railway, something else, quite a long way, to the point that whatever was making the noise, I could not see it, because the old railway line is flanked on both sides by trees, and really high bushes, and... uh, it gets really dark, so anything a hundred yards ahead couldn't be seen. But something else came charging up onto the railway line in the distance. And what was in front of us turned its head and looked over its shoulder to see what was making the noise. And it looked, and it was sniffing. And then it t- it turned its back on us as a group. It turned its back on us, and it it took a few paces forward. Then it started to run upright on two legs, and then it's then it dropped to all fours. And each bound seemed to last a long time. Between, from one leap to the next, or from one, from when it was running, one stride to the next, the distance could have been Five or six of my strides, if not more. It was, it was off. It it moved. It moved with a lot of speed, 
but it also moved a lot gracefully with elegance. But whatever it was chasing at this point, it was it it was it was it was it meant business. As it's kind of disappeared into the darkness, whatever it was chasing shot off to the left, down the left hand banking, through the bushes and trees, through a kind of swampy area. And when I say a swampy area, I don't mean like a Louisiana swamp, I mean it just a really boggy and waterlogged area. And it, it went charging, the wolf went charging through there, off. We couldn't see them any further anymore, they were gone. Now this whole time felt like an eternity, from this thing ending up in front of us, to it being stood up to it, being staring at all of us, and then turning away and chasing something in the distance. It seemed to last uh, hours and hours. In reality, I think it must have lasted 60 seconds to 90 seconds. But it's like time slowed down that whole time it was in front of me. It was... It was... It was... It was very... Very strange, but once it was gone, we kind of felt relieved that it was gone. But where we were there at that point, we were closer to home than we were to town. And we decided rather than double back on ourselves, going to town to get a taxi to home. But it was counter in, counterproductive, so we, we we decided we were going to continue walking down the old railway in the direction that this dog man ran, and whatever it was chasing ran as well. Uh, we did, and we seemed to do it in pretty much silence, the odd whisper between us now and again um, the whole time a couple of the girls were were tearful but we continued walking felt like we were being watched some of the time by who by what we didn't know and from where we weren't sure, but we carried on. There comes a point where they're along the old railway line, where the old station is. It's it's no longer there now. It's all been backfilled to make a slope, a gradual slope for dog walkers and cyclists to take go down onto the old railway. Back then, the old station was in ruins. It was overgrown. There was no doors or windows left. It, it, it was it was completely overgrown. But it gave us a way up onto the main road. Once we got onto that main road, I took a sigh of relief. And it's at that point we all kind of looked at each other and we kind of didn't really talk about what had happened. Um, Neil and Caroline said their farewells. They were going to Neil's house, which was off to the left from where we'd come onto the main road. Um, Steve and Martin they took off walking to the right which is where they both lived about a mile up that way um, myself I was going to Julie's 
um, from where we were, where we'd come off the old railway line, we crossed over the road to the right hand side. Um, and we were about, I think it was the fourth house along from that point was, was where Julie lived. Um, Shirley and Anthony were coming to Julie's as well. So we got, we got to Julie's and as Julie was opening the doors, Anthony looked at me and said, we're being watched. He could feel it as well as me. I just didn't want to say it, especially in front of Julie, who was, I think she was having a hard, well, she was, we were all having a hard time dealing with what we'd just seen, but she was having a really tough time of it. So we, we was at Julie's house. We went inside. Once in, I went round the entire house, checking every window. All the doors were locked. All the windows locked. And the original plan was we were going to go back to Julie's and have a few more drinks and whatnot. But we didn't. We decided that we'd all have a coffee. So I put the coffee on. And Julie said to me, she said, would you mind letting the dogs out in the backyard? And I said, yeah, fine. She had a pair of um, yappy chihuahuas. So I opened the door. So I let them in the yard and they wouldn't go out. That is the first time I've ever seen those dogs refuse to go out. They refused point blank to go out. So after a couple of minutes, I said, fine, you're not going out. I locked the door, locked the door again. While we were all sat there in Julie's uh, lounge, a um, couple of security lights at the side of the house came on. And then the one in the backyard came on. The one in the backyard, quite a big, bright light lit the entire yard up, came on. So I I moved quickly to that door and I'm trying to peep through the blinds but couldn't really see anything. So I unlocked the door and I slowly opened the door Took my head outside, couldn't see anything. Um, Anthony was behind me. He'd gone out into the backyard, and there was nothing there. So I went to the side of the house, and there was nothing there. The lights are still on, but there was nothing there. But there was a horrible smell of rotting meat and wet dog. So this thing knew where we were. So we decided that we were just going to go in and tell Julie and Shirley that we didn't know. We didn't know what the, what it was. I think perhaps it was a cat that set the, uh, the security lights off. And, and we left it at that. That is the first time. That was the first of the encounters. And we all had a tough time trying to process what we'd seen. 
whenever I've tried to talk to anybody else, any of the, uh, any of our group who were there, whenever I've tried to talk to any of the others about what we saw on that night, they don't want to talk about it. Now, 24 years on to where we are now, um, me and Anthony, still best friends, still see each other a lot. And if I do try to bring the subject up, he shuts it down. He will not talk about it. He will not talk about it at all. Um, and none of the others want to talk about it. Needless to say, um, It was it was it was something that's, that that has stuck with me for a long time. But that was that was the first that was the first encounter. Now that all happened on the Friday night into the early hours of Saturday morning. And a few days later it would have been the Wednesday, the Tuesday or the Wednesday of the following week, I was back at home. And I was in bed. Now, I had a dog, but my dog used to sleep on the floor at the end of my bed. And... He was a big beast of a dog. He was he was a Doberman cross with a German Shepherd. He was big and powerful. But he was soft as well. He was a very gentle dog. And he used to sleep at the end of my bed. This particular night, I've gone to bed about 11 o'clock. Watched a little bit of telly in bed. Turned the telly off around midnight-ish. And I don't know how long I'd been asleep, but I woke up to my dog pacing around my bedroom. And the noise he was making a it was a noise, it was a it was a, a whimper mixed with a growl. But it was a low a low guttural growl. He was he was scared. Something had spooked him. So I got out of bed. I tried to get him to calm down, but he, he he wouldn't. He didn't want me to touch him. So I went to my window and tried to peep through the blinds to see if I could see anything outside, and I couldn't. I couldn't see anything, so I opened the blinds. And I opened my bedroom window as wide as I could. And once I'd opened the blinds as wide as I could, that smell hit me again. It was wet dog with rotting meat. And... I was, my heart started to pound. Now, just to set the tone for you, I'm in the upstairs bedroom window. I've got a, I've got a, a bit of a garden at the front of the house. A uh, bit of a lawn. Um, 25 foot maybe from the house to the, to the, to the road. And then on the path there was a there was a, a you know a lamp post um, street lighting and don't know why I looked at my car but I looked at my car and on the hood of my car was a dead badger. 
And this thing hadn't been dead long. Because the blood was dripping off the hood of the car. And also where my car is and where my house is. Mine's the last house in the street. Directly facing my house is a big field. It's a huge farmer's field. He sometimes uses it for cattle. He sometimes uses it just to just to grow the grass and get hay bales for his cattle in winter. This field seems to go on forever. And it also comes up to the side of my house um, as well. And as I've looked at my car and seen this dead badger, then I've looked into the field and I'm trying to scan to see if I can see anything because this is the only, that, that street light is the only light I've got to be able to see this thing. And as I did, about 34, 30 or 40 feet into the field was a big, dark coloured figure. And it was the dog man again. And then it's raised its left arm it was staring directly at me i said that was that was the only the street light was the only source of light i had but once i could see the dog man the eyes they kind of glowed like lights and this thing was staring at me and it kind of raised its arm, its left arm. And it was kind of like it was just, just giving me a, a, a wave to, to acknowledge that it's, it's seen me and it knows where I live. It knows where I am. I didn't do anything. I didn't wave back. I didn't say anything. I just stared. And it's turned its back on me then. And it's walking slowly through the long grass. It's at that point that I spotted the other two. There was two more dogmen with him. Um, very, very similar size to that dog mount, the first one. They just stood looking. And they too, they both turned around and started walking. As they've got a little further into the field, They started running and they've run completely. They've run into the darkness. I can't see them anymore. I can just hear them. And as they're running, they're making noises to each other. And that was like a, a low guttural. I wouldn't say a growl, I'd just say it was kind of their way of communicating with each other. But it, 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 they knew where I was. That was my second encounter. I didn't sleep the rest of that night. I stayed awake. I stayed awake. And I stayed next to that window watching. 
and I decided in the morning I was getting up relatively early. I was going to go to the gym and I was going to have to get my car washed. Um, I've got up in the morning. I've tried to dispose of this this badger. Um, I dug um I dug a shallow grave. Uh, in the in the the end, beginning of the field at the side of the house, I just I just dug a bit of a grave and buried it, covered it over. Um, before I set off to the gym, I'd phoned Julie because we were meeting up later that day. And uh, when I spoke to her, she was upset. And she'd had a dead rabbit left on her back doorstep, which is the same door that I opened on the night of the first encounter to let her dogs in the backyard. And she's opened that door that morning to let the dogs out and there was a dead rabbit on the step. These things know where we are. I don't know if it's never it never did it. It never left anything for Anthony or Shirley or Neil or any of the others. It never left anybody anything apart from me and Jewel. I don't know why. I don't suppose I'll ever know why. But I don't. And that was the end. As far as the second encounter, that was it. And my third encounter happened on Wednesday of last week. Now I no longer live in that house. Um, I live close to where that house is. Literally a few minutes walk away from where that house is. But I live in an apartment. And I think it was the 8th of January 2020. I think it was last Wednesday. And because I am waiting for the surgery on my back, my sleep pattern is pretty much all over the place. So I grab sleep when I can. And um, quite often I can be up late watching TV or I could be on YouTube listening to Vic Cundiff on Dogman Encounters and I was watching um, YouTube on my iPad and the, the iPad was the only source of light I had on in my, in my room, in my bedroom and I heard some strange noises. Now at first I thought it was cats fighting or some other, some other animal uh, fighting and curiosity, nosiness, call it what you will, got better of me. I went to the window and I looked into the street and I couldn't see anything. So I opened my bedroom window and I really need to stop opening my bedroom window because when I open my bedroom window, I always seem to see a dog man. But I open my bedroom window and at first I couldn't really see anything. And then across the road from my apartment building 
is houses. And one of the houses across the street, I could see there was something on the drive, but where the where the street light is, it was casting a shadow so that whatever was up there drive was just just in the shadows. And I could just about see there was something in the shadows, but I couldn't tell what. And at first I thought it was somebody possibly trying to break in. But whoever or whatever this thing was knew that I was there. It's heard me opening my bedroom window. And then... It's it's moved again, so it was it was partly revealing itself. It was coming into the light a little bit, but not it wasn't showing itself completely. It was just showing part of itself. So to say, I'm here, and it it's at that point again that I got that I got that smell. That same smell. It's exactly the same smell. It's a, it's it, it's it's a smell that I have never never smelt since them encounters in nineteen ninety six. Smelt exactly the same. Um. And. Then it's moved into into view a little bit more. Now I can see its face. Now I can I couldn't tell you if it was the same one that I saw in 1996. Uh, I know I've got a few grey hairs now after 24 years. I'm assuming if this was the same dog man, that would have a few grey hairs, but it was too far away for me to see. And I don't know if it was the same one or not. But this thing came into view a little better. And I could see the eyes, them amber eyes. The ears stood up right on top of the head. And I could see one of the hands on a really thick trunk of an arm as it's moved more into the light. You can see the bulging muscles. I don't, I'm not saying that this dog man was out looking for me. God knows what he was looking for. I haven't a clue. Maybe he was hunting. I don't know. Uh, but this thing knew that I'd seen it. But it didn't seem to care that I'd seen it. It just didn't phase it one bit. It just... It was very blase about it. And then it's moved completely into sight at this point. And again, I'm in disbelief because of the sheer size of this creature. It's huge. And then as quick as I saw it, it's dropped down to all fours and it's run off. And it's run in the direction of the old railway. The old railway line that we all walked up in 1996. So... thinking that these things don't exist because I'm a horror movie fan I love anything with werewolves and vampires in I thought this was all uh, it was all fiction it was all for the movies so I never ever in a million years thought I'd see anything like this in, in real life to see it three times is 
I think now that after talking to Rick, that these things want us to see them. They don't mind us seeing them, which is a good in some ways, and it's not in others. But through talking to Vic and through listening to countless other people's uh, encounters, this has helped me a great deal to deal with what actually happened on that night. Um, myself and Julie never did get married. She's now in New Zealand, I believe. And like I said at the beginning, Caroline and Martin are both dead. But they wanted us to see them. I just hope that if somebody's listening to this, I hope that this can help you, like me listening to other people has helped me deal with this. And if you don't want to listen to me, then you need to get in touch with Vic. That was my three dogman encounters. Just one of those encounters would be enough to push a lot of people over the edge. The fact you're dealing with them as well as you are says a lot about your constitution, Simon. This is a delicate topic, but you said you saw genitals on the first dogman you saw. Were they more human-like or canine-like in appearance? Um, they were more human-like, actually. That was the baffling thing about it. There was, it had canine features. It had a lot of canine distinguishable things about it, but it also had a lot of human looking things about it that was the bit that we, i just i was struggling to get my head around at first but yeah its genitals were more human like definitely well there are a lot of things about those encounters that the average person would struggle to get their head around so now that's understandable talking about the first encounter you said the dog man was nine to ten feet tall how high would you say your eyes were relative to his body when he was standing in front of you there? I'd say around just above the belly button. So just around the torso, just above the waist, I'd say I was looking. So, yeah, he was... Um, the strange thing is his legs seem to be the, the longest part of him. Uh, the torso, as big and as jacked up as it was, seemed to be the shorter part. So the legs seem to be abnormally tall, the back legs. But I suppose that went in that that way. They sort of that were proportionate to the to the length of the his arms and or front legs, whichever you want to call them. So. But yeah, I was stood roughly to the torso, mid-torso. Wow, that's a big specimen. When you and your friends were standing there three to four feet from that giant dog man, did any of you make any sounds? Um, I'm not entirely sure because all I could hear, apart from the dog man breathing and that, that low guttural back of the throat sound they make, was my heart I could I could hear my heart thumping. Um like I say it felt like it was gonna thump out of my chest and I could if I could hear my own heartbeat I couldn't really hear what anybody else was saying and I could hear Julie because she was trying not to cry out loud and with her holding on to me that's pretty much all I could hear. Um my senses were taking such a battering that I couldn't really take any more on board. So even if my friends had been screaming, I don't think I'd have heard them. My senses were on overload. Yeah, I'll bet your pulse was pounding in your ears, but that would happen with anyone. When you balled up your fists, how close did you come to actually trying to hit him? I really, really wanted to. 
I really, really wanted to. He was at that time. I'd say we were we were no more than three feet away from each other, um, and I knew exactly where I was going to punch it. I was going to go straight for its genitals. If I was going to hit it, I was going to hit it there first. Yeah, well, if you're going to hit him, I guess that's about as good of a place as any. Was him moving his head back and forth as if to warn you not to try to hit him the only reason why you didn't try it? Yeah, it was the look on its face. The the, the way it was kind of looking, looking down at me and the way it shook its head. It was kind of like a level of intelligence that I would never have expected a creature like that to be able to display. And it was kind of like it, it knew it kind of it's like it knew what I was knew what I was thinking. But it, it also knew that if I did do that, then it'd have to retaliate. And it didn't. I don't think it wanted to. Like you said to me yesterday when we spoke. It's like these these dogmen, they choose us. They choose who they want to reveal themselves to, which is why not a lot of people really have seen them. In the grand scheme of things, it's a very small percentage of the world that have actually seen these creatures. So I think they are very, very selective of who they reveal themselves to. Yeah, it seems like they are. Like you said, they're awfully intelligent and they know what they're doing, unfortunately. Would you describe his head as being proportionate in size relative to his body or disproportionately large? Actually, you know, I think... <laughs> For the size of of the body, I'd say the head was pretty much in proportion with the size of its body. Um, if you're talking about the head as a as a single entity, the head was huge. But after saying that, so was the entire dog man itself was huge. So I'd say the head was in proportion to the size of the beast. Yeah, if he's a 9 or 10 footer, even if that head wasn't disproportionately large in proportion to the body, wow, his head must have been huge. Yeah, it was. When he was standing there right in front of you, what was he doing with his hands? He was moving his fingers slowly, but he wasn't moving them in a threatening way towards any of us. They were just moving slowly um but they weren't doing anything to cause anybody any any harm and they weren't he wasn't they weren't pointing at anything and he didn't clench its own fists so yeah it's not surprising you'd say that don't know what's behind it but it's pretty common for them to kind of like twiddle their fingers a little bit when they're standing there looking at you again no idea what that's all about but that's pretty common when he finally turned to leave, what did you notice about his back? When he turned to leave, its back was very dog-like. Um, it seemed to have that natural, the natural arch of a dog's back, like some dogs have got a natural arch to the back. And to me, it's, it seems like the bigger the dog, the bigger the arch in the back. It's like a little black like shit shih doesn't have much of an arch at all. It seems very flat. It's back when it's stood up, whereas some bigger dogs have got a, a slight arch to the back, and it seemed to have that. And it's, the arch seemed more prominent as it dropped to all fours. Its shoulders had moved forward to support the weight of itself, and that's when the arch of its back seemed to be more prominent. But it was incredibly well muscled all over front back top bottom it was it was just a it was a mass of muscle um that's what i was, I, I, I was meaning when i said yesterday that if it wanted to it could have quite easily killed all of us in a blink of an eye and it didn't it it <laughs> It obviously meant no harm because, well, we're still here. Um, it just, it, so many things go through your mind when you're face to face with one of them. 
and then it, it, as soon as it's it's gone, you forget half of what you're thinking at the time. And you remember it. You it takes like it's something it could be something small that will remind you of that day when you had the encounter. It's uh, it's strange. I'm, I'm of the belief that it revealed itself to us as a group and it had its own reason for doing so. Um, no, I'm, 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 I'm an animal lover anyway. I, I love all animals really. But that is something that I would never have dreamt of coming face to face with in a million years. And like I said yesterday, it's something that, it's something that you only dream of seeing in movies. It really is. And for me, for me, the dogman that we was, that we were looking at facially, it looked like, you know, that scene in American Werewolf in London before the before the armed police shoot the werewolf, and it's 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 a close up a close up of the the wolf's the werewolf's face, and it's snarling and it's staring and you know it's looking straight ahead, that vicious look of it. That is the closest representation in a movie to what was in front of us on that night. Just the eye colour was different. Um, but it's, to be honest with you, even though this has happened to me now three times, it's not something that I wish had never happened. It's happened for a reason. Maybe I'll never know what that reason was, but it's happened. And I'm, I'm going to be, I've always, I'm going to be a live and let live person. Let it, let it do what it's doing because there's been no reported injuries or fatalities in the UK. So it's obviously not harming anybody. The one thing that puzzles me is how does something that size live in the wild? If you think of the UK, we're, we're not as, we're nowhere near as big in in land mass as the USA and I mean I think England as a whole could fit in some states in the US that have just got a big ass bank like for instance the Rockies and parts of Alaska they are so big so vast you could actually pick the UK up and sit it in the middle of this you know expanse of land so you can see how they get away with being undetected in America, but in the UK, I just want to know where they hide. You know where they hide when they're not revealing themselves. Where do they live? Where do they? Where, where do they keep themselves out of sight? It's 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 baffling, but at the same time, they're not doing any harm. And as frightening as it was on that night, it's kind of made me what I am today, I suppose. It's gone towards it anyway, at least. Well, don't lose sight of the fact that most eyewitnesses there who see dogmen aren't reporting their encounters, so you wouldn't even know that they're having them. That adds to the problem why so many people don't believe dogmen exist there. Before we move on, when you said that he had an arch to his back, does that mean that you saw a hump as well? Uh, yeah. Um, I think the hump was really the um, the biggest knot of muscles on the back of its shoulders. Because you think if 
as they go over on all fours and they're going to run as a dog would normally run, the shoulders and the across the back of the uh, the neck and uh, that's got to be extremely heavily muscled to support the weight of an animal that size. So yeah, there was there was a hump. Um, the arch dog I'm on about is more towards the back of a dog where you're not just before where the tail starts it's there and that was another thing I found odd this had a lot of dog qualities and a lot of human qualities it didn't have a tail there was no tail well some have tails some don't so it just varies after having such an up-close and intense dogman encounter, would you say it was worse standing feet away from that giant dogman or having to deal with the aftermath of that experience? Um, I think it's worse afterwards, trying to, trying to get it straight in your head what you've seen and, you know, what, what was it and... You're asking yourself all these questions that you just haven't got an answer to. So I'd say the aftermath of seeing it is worse than the actual initial encounter. It's easy to think that after you have a dogman encounter and the dogman moves on, or maybe you move away from the dogman, that that's it. The encounter is over, but as you now know, yeah, that couldn't be further from the truth. You had your life turned upside down because of the dogman encounters you've had, Simon. What kinds of thoughts go through your head when you read about people who want to have dogman encounters of their own? Um, people might want to have a dogman encounter because they think of the, they, they, they might be thinking of of publicity or for, for whatever reasons they want to do it don't wish for it because those i think those are the people that if it did happen to them i don't think they'd cope i really don't um i mean i'd i've i've tried to get on with my life since the 1996 encounters and I've done a, a decent enough job of getting on with my life but that most recently I'd say over the last 12 months it's now I've been able to put a name to that face because I never we didn't know what we'd seen we all thought it was a werewolf and it's only after listening to dogman encounters and i've listened to lots and lots of people's encounters about what it's done to them and how their encounters went and it's only after listening to them that i realized what i had in front of me on that night and I don't know, it seems that, because I can kind of put a name to the face, so to speak, it's helped me come to terms with what I saw. Um, after what we were saying yesterday, when we, when we chatted yesterday, Vic, that these things choose who they reveal themselves to, the way I'm thinking about it now is it's more of an honour for them to reveal themselves to whoever they reveal themselves to. They seem to know that whoever they reveal themselves to won't harm them and they won't have to retaliate. I don't think these are naturally aggressive or violent creatures. I think what they're doing, revealing themselves to people, is... They're trying to, I might be way off of the mark, but it's kind of like they're trying to reveal themselves to people to gain acceptance so people actually know what they are and they're not to be feared. But 
that's just the way I'm thinking about it. And I feel quite privileged to have seen them. And I think it's quite obvious that after the second encounter, when it turned to leave, and I noticed that there was two others with it, so there was three of them all together. They are pack animals. So, as well as the one that we could see on the first encounter, and then the second one that we heard way off in the distance, I'm beginning to think that there could have been another one behind us where we couldn't see it, watching what was going on the whole turn. I think there was more of them watching us than we actually thought. Yeah, there just might have been. How sure are you that the dogman you saw that waved at you in your second encounter was the same one you saw in your first encounter? Um, I can't be 100% certain it's the same one. It's... it's I, I can't... I wouldn't think of... Um, after that first encounter, because it was a very, very intense moment, I can't imagine a second, a different one coming and like, I think it was leaving the dead badger as a gift in, in, in it's, it, it's, it's got its own way of thinking. It may have left this badger as a gift. I don't think a different dog man would have left a gift when that one's never come face to face with me. So I, 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 I firmly believe it was the same one, but I couldn't be 100% certain unless, again, I was face to face with it. And I wasn't leaving my bedroom. There was no way I was going outside. <laughs> Not until daylight, anyway. Well, I can't say I'll blame you there at all. You said you don't know if the dogman you saw last Wednesday was the same one you saw in your first two encounters, but you did say it was huge. How big did it look? I'd say it was uh virtu- I'd say it was about the same size as the first one. Um when I first saw it and it started to come into the light a little bit and just reveal it revealed itself bit by bit. Um it was like it was doing it kind of kind of it, it was crouching a little bit. Um you know, when a child, a, t- a kind of a childish, um, peeping round the corner kind of, uh, kind of thing. So it wasn't, it wasn't stood up to its full height, but it did do before it ran off. It did actually stand to its full height again. And I mean, even with, I don't know, 40 to 50 meters between us. I could tell it was incredibly muscular physique. Um, again, the genitals were on show. But I, I'd, I'd say it was about the same size as the first. Well, considering how big you said it was and the way it behaved, it just might have been the same dog man. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, Simon, having said that, it's about time for us to get out of here. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Yes, um, I was listening to one earlier in the week, and it was a dogman encounter about a bloke who I can't remember whereabouts in uh, the states he was, but he was actually going to go out and try and hunt one of these things down to capture it. He had a friend who was a marksman, and he was a brilliant sniper. And he was going to try and catch one of these things. Uh, and I don't know what his end game was, whether he wanted to do scientific research with it or perhaps sell it to the government, whatever. I wouldn't advise it. I would never advise you go out with a malicious end game. I wouldn't go out and try and maliciously harm these creatures because they are more than capable. I mean, like I said, that could have quite easily there was there was eight of us on the first encounter and it could have literally if it had swiped at me where i was stood it would have literally torn my head off with the size of its hand 
that's without the claws. It's hand by itself. It could have ripped my head clean off with one one movement. Uh, with those claws as well, it would have killed us all within in less than 10 seconds, easily. And these things have got the ability, they've got the tools to do the job. The fact that they're not doing that, just don't take that as a sign of weakness. Just respect what they're about. Um, let them be. Because you know, they could quite easily make life extremely difficult for somebody if they wanted to. They sure could, and it's really good you understand that. Simon, I want to thank you so much for coming on and telling us about all those experiences. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks again so much for your time. Have a great night. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.